cord. Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us and taking the time to learn more about identity theft in general and tax identity theft in particular. I'm Eva Velasquez, President and CEO of the Identity Theft Resource Center, and I'm joined today with our great partner, the Federal Trade Commission, Sina Grison, one of my good friends. Um, we're going to give you lots of good information today about both uh, this issue about the Identity Theft Resource Center and the Federal Trade Commission and the services that we have to offer. We'll start with an overview of what we'll cover today. Um, broadly, we're going to talk about what identity theft is in general and how you can spot it, identify it, because it can be sometimes a little bit of a nebulous concept. We'll then narrow the conversation down into what is tax identity theft, how it happens, how you as an individual can minimize your risk and reduce your risk surface, and of course, finally, what you can do if it actually does happen to you, if you're one of the millions of people that is affected by this problem every year. And then finally, we'll talk about IRS imposter scams, because even though that is not an identity theft issue per se, they're all tied into each other because because it is part of a, a scam that's using the IRS in that position of trust in order to get you to part with either your money or your identity credentials. So we'll start with what is identity theft and I'm going to allow uh, Sina to go ahead and take it away and give us this broad overview. Oh, great. Thanks, Eve. It's great to be here today and I really want to thank you and the ITRC for hosting this webinar and inviting us to participate. Tax identity theft is such an important issue for all of us. It before is. Thank you, Sina. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, before I start, I do need to tell you that the statements that I make here today are my own and don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the Federal Trade Commission or any of its individual commissioners. Okay, so what is tax identity theft? Well, when we're talking about identity theft, uh, and let's start with that. We're talking about the actual misuse of someone's personal information. So it could be misused to fraudulently obtain goods and services, like if someone uses your credit card to buy a big screen TV, or if someone uses your insurance policy ID to get medical care. Or your information could be misused by someone trying to hide from the government or law enforcement or from people who, other people who perform background checks. What we're distinguishing here is the misuse of your personal information uh, from exposure. There's a lot of talk about data breaches these days, and of course, the exposure of information in data be breaches, uh, that's a very serious matter. But we're really going to focus here on uh, the actual misuse of your information, not just its exposure. Okay, next slide. So let's just get an idea of how big a problem identity theft is. The Department of Justice just released its most recent uh, survey findings on this. And according to the DOJ's Bureau of Justice Statistics, 26 million people in the US were victims of identity theft in 2016. That's one out of every 10 people aged 16 and up. That number is up from 17.6 million in 2014, so that's a nearly 50% increase over just two years. And you can see that the losses from identity theft are huge, $17.5 billion in 2016. And uh, most recently at the FTC, where we also take identity theft complaints, we saw, uh, we had 444,600 people tell us they were ID identity theft victims in 2018. Next slide, please. So let's just look briefly at some of the forms that identity theft can take. Uh, it could be someone opening a credit card or utility account in your name, or someone using your information to get a loan or a job or medical care. Or as we'll discuss today, they can misuse your information to get a tax, uh, tax refund. The important thing to remember here is that whatever the form identity theft takes, the impact on victims can be substantial and it could lead to serious problems. 
it's not just as simple as reporting your credit card as stolen and getting a new one. If someone has misused your information to get credit, you may be denied credit, uh, like a mortgage uh, for a house you're hoping to buy, or you could be denied even public benefits, say if uh, you're receiving disability benefits, but someone else uses your social security number to work. Your records would show that you're, you were working and you could be told that because of your work history, you're no longer disabled, so you can't get public benefits. You can, of course, be harassed by debt collectors uh, for debts that aren't yours, and you can even be denied medical care or receive improper treatment if, say, the identity thief used your ID to get care and the thief's medical records became merged with yours. One other thing I want to note, identity theft often is a cascading crime, and by that I mean it may start out with the discovery that someone opened a credit uh, card account in your name. However, you may find out months later that other accounts were opened or that your information was misused for some other purpose. Today we're talking about identity theft and and, and, uh, tax identity theft, and that means your social security number was exposed. And once your social security number is out there, it could be misused for so many other types of identity theft. so, so really, it, it, tax identity theft can, can be one of these problems that grows over time. The ITRC has looked in depth into the anxiety, stress, and other emotional problems that identity theft causes. So I'm going to turn it, turn it over to Eva to talk about the other victim impacts that, that the Identity Theft Resource Center sees in working with identity theft victims every day. Eva? Thank you, Sina. We, we saw the impact numbers before when we're looking at the, the scope and the scale of this problem. So uh, how many people were affected and how much money did they lose? And often uh, studies will also look at how much time did it take for you to resolve the issue. And that's, that's important information to be sure. It, it gives us a lot of um, important data about uh, how big the problem is. But we at the ITRC decided quite a long time ago that there was so much more to this problem and the impact was so much greater that we needed to do more research in this area. So every year we survey the victims that we've helped in a previous year and we we go much deeper into what these impacts are. Now you're seeing these uh, percentages on the screen that 83% felt violated, um, 67% felt a sense of powerlessness or helplessness. And, and while that's interesting information, you may be wondering what, what good is it to measure these things and why are you doing that? Well, when we understand how this is impacting people, the emotional, the, the physical, the societal, and I'll be getting to those in just a moment, it better informs us of how we can provide our services, how we can enhance those services to not only help people remediate the actual identity theft issue, but also to help them overcome the trauma of being a crime victim. So when we see that more than half, close to two thirds, are uh, feeling that sense of powerlessness or helplessness that lets us know that we need to use an empowerment model in all of our interactions with with victims. So this is very important um, information for us to have to inform how we're going to better help victims and address their needs. Now look at the the physical impacts here. I I think some of these are somewhat intuitive. Um, Yes, you would have report increased stress. Yes, you might have disrupted sleep habits and even problems with concentration. But the the headaches and stomach issues, the increased fatigue and and kind of getting, you know, overall depressed about the problem, um, those, those are a little more surprising, I think, for most people that see these numbers. And when you think about how this affects an individual, and then think about how this type of behavior can then start to affect um, all the people in the victim's um, orbit, all the people that are interacting with that victim on a regular basis. So their family members, their close friends, even their coworkers. 
when you have a problem concentrating on your daily life and all of the tasks that you need to be taking care of, generally speaking, somebody else is going to be picking up the slack, a fa again, a family member or a coworker. So then we start to see the tentacles that this crime can create and how this can reach into other aspects of the victim's life and affect not just the person whose information was misused, but again, all of the people in their circle. And if we step back a little bit and really look at the, the societal, the national impact of this crime, um, we've got these high numbers reporting that it created a financial gap for them. This, this incident created a gap and they had to find a way to meet those needs with some people using savings, some people noting that they had to go into debt, um, some saying they could not pay their bills, others said they had to borrow money from family and friends. And think about the effect that that has on our overall economy. There are a couple of pieces here to break down. The first one being that if you have friends and family members who are helping a crime victim to overcome that shortfall and they've had to either give them or loan them money, that's money that they themselves are not putting back into their local economy. Maybe they've cut back on going out to dinner so the local restaurants are feeling that pain. Maybe they can't participate in the school fundraiser for the in the neighborhood and so the schools are feeling that pain. It has again it has this long reach and we want people to be aware of that as well as when you look at the emotional impacts of uh, folks saying I felt like I couldn't I felt violated and like I couldn't trust. Trust is a cornerstone of our economy. If consumers can't trust the businesses, the platforms, the entities that they're interacting with, it's proven that they pull back, they disengage, and then they hang on to their money and they aren't spending it in the legitimate areas that we want everybody to spend it so that we can continue to grow. Now we're going to get into very specifically tax identity theft. So that was a broad overview of identity theft in general and some of the ramification that that we don't often think about. Now we'll narrow it to tax identity theft. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Sina go ahead and talk about what tax identity theft is. Great, thanks Eva. That, that's really a great overview of the impact uh, uh, of, of identity theft on individuals and society in general. And it's really important that we keep that in mind as we work with identity theft victims. So thank you for that. Now, we've talked about identity theft broadly, so let's focus on tax identity theft in particular. What is it? What we're mainly talking about here is when somebody files a fraudulent tax return using your social security number. And the reason why they're doing that is to get a refund, basically to claim your refund for themselves. All they need is your social security number, which they can buy on the black market. Then they can file for a refund. When you try to get your refund, you get a notice from the IRS saying that yours is a duplicate filing and that your refund, and, and you may find out that your refund is going to be delayed as a result. Uh, so that's the main thing we're talking about uh, on tax identity theft. That's tax refund fraud. But this slide also lists a few other types of identity theft that we include under the name of, ta of, of, of tax identity theft. And it's when someone claims your children as, defend, uh, as dependents or when someone claims a refund using a deceased taxpayer's information. It can also include when someone earns wages under your social security number. Then when you file a tax return listing the wages you actually earned, the IRS says, how come you didn't pay taxes on these other wages? In fact, it was the thief earning those wages, not you. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this kind of tax ID theft. When I do, I'll refer to it as wage or, or employment-related ID theft. That's to distinguish it from that tax refund fraud. Uh, next slide, please. And before I advance to the next slide, I just want to throw a comment in there because I talk to people um, quite frequently about tax identity theft, and they say to me things like, well, I'm not getting a refund anyway. I always have to pay, so it doesn't matter to me. And it's really important for people to understand that the, the thief does not really care about your true picture when it comes to your tax situation. Whether you are getting a refund, whether you're getting earned income credits, whether you um, are a high wage earner or not, they are making everything else up 
they can make up your employer, your earnings. Uh, uh, they'll have a false, a fraudulent W-2. So those pieces are irrelevant. And I don't want folks to walk away thinking, well, this is only a problem for someone who is banking on or planning on receiving a refund. It's actually not the case. It's a problem for anyone whose social security number has been made available to the thieves. And now I'll um, move back to the next slide so you can follow up on that, Sina. Oh, that, that's a great point. Thanks so much for, 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 for bringing that up. Um, this slide is going to look at some of the short-term trends that we've been seeing. Um, and this slide and the next few slides, they're based on the FTC's consumer sentinel data of all identity theft complaints that are filed with us. And if, like even me, you're in the business of tracking identity theft, these slides are really interesting. Here we see that last year, the total number of all identity theft complaints to the FTC uh, rose by 20% from the year before. But tax identity theft complaints, complaints about tax refund fraud, they were down by a substantial number, 38%. While complaints about that employment-related ID theft, when somebody is using your social security number to, to get a job and earn wages, they were up by a hefty 44%. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But I also want to call your attention to the slight increase we saw in IRS in, imposter scam complaints. They were up by 7% last year. So uh, between 2016 and 2017, complaints about IRS imposter scams dropped by a whopping 54%. So we're hoping that 7% increase that we're seeing now is just a short-term bounce. Next slide, please. Now, this graph is uh, tracking the total number of identity theft complaints the, the FTC received over the past five years. That's that blue line up top and the number of tax-related identity theft complaints uh, that we received, that's the orange line. And here, when I'm referring to tax-related uh, identity theft complaints, I'm talking about complaints both about tax refund fraud and complaints about employment-related ID theft. Now, from 2014 uh, through 2017, complaints about tax-related identity theft seem to be driving the total number of identity theft complaints, at least in part. You can see that in 2015, tax-related ID theft complaints made, it, made up almost half the number of total ID theft complaints the FTC received. But since 2017, it looks like that may be changing. We see those two lines going in opposite directions. So we're going to have to watch that trend, see if it really develops into a trend. But it seems that something is is occurring there uh, with respect to tax-related identity theft. Next slide, please. Okay, and here's another look at the uh, at that data. This slide goes back just three years, but that you can. But you can see that complaints about tax-related identity theft, and that's both tax refund fraud and employment-related fraud, they've made up a declining percentage of the total number of identity theft complaints that we, we've received at the FTC over the past few years, uh, going from 33.5% in 2016 to 15.7% last year. That's great news, but we know that tax-related identity theft remains a big problem for many, many consumers. And in fact, it's consistently been one of the top identity theft uh, complaints that we've received at the FTC. So that's why it's so important for, import, important for consumers to know about tax-related identity theft and why we're focusing on it today. Next slide, please. So let's turn to how tax identity theft happens. And it can happen in a number of ways. And I'm going to turn it over to Eva to discuss. Thanks, Sina. So we've, we've sort of separated this out into two categories. We've got analog and digital. Um, so this list is uh, definitely more, more analog. It's 
um, lost or stolen wallets, Medicare cards. Okay, we do have devices on here. Um, but, you know, these are mobile things, things that we carry with us. It, they, they will tend to be smaller in scale as far as the overall number of individuals who are affected in a single theft. So while you may get complaints about uh, mail theft in a, in a neighborhood, it usually won't simultaneously happen to an entire state or region. And while you may get um, complaints and issues with people losing their, their mobile device or their wallet, it's not going to hit an entire county uh, within a particular city. And imposter scams are the one I want to spend the most time on because often when we think of scams, we think that the only thing people are going to lose, and I don't say this lightly like it's not a big deal, um, but that the only thing they are going to be parted with is their hard-earned cash, their dollars. And for sure, that is one of the things that's motivating the scammers. But uh, we are seeing more and more often that there's a one-two punch, that the, the scammers, once they get somebody on the line that they have convinced that they are in some way legitimate, they will not only ask for them to part with their money, but they will ask for those identity credentials as well. So at the same time that you're wiring that $2,000 or sending those $4,000 worth of gift cards in the mail, you are also sending the scammer a copy of your driver's license or your passport or other types of documents copy of your social security card that they can then use to monetize your identity at a later date. And for your identity credentials online, the, the reality is we are using them to authenticate ourselves in so many ways because we are so connected. It's absolutely ubiquitous and we've gotten very used to it. Uh, data breaches, something that we've been tracking for over a decade, um, largely out of the consumer's hands once they have allowed a, an entity to house their information. So that is something that we talk with organizations about all the time, that they have a responsibility to be good stewards of that information. But then we get more into where consumers actually have some impact and they have the ability to be more guarded and protect their identity credentials. Um, emails coming from imposters, and some of them are so sophisticated. Back in the day, and Sina probably remembers this, um, I'm dating myself a bit here, but we used to actually educate people on how to spot a scammy email, how to spot a phishing email. There would be um, grammar errors and typos, and the logos would either be off or they would be um, of a really poor, low quality or just not structured the same way that the actual business would structure their communication. And now that's simply not the case. There's, there's almost no way if you're just looking at the surface and the content of some of these uh, phony emails to actually be able to spot them. So now we say just be cautious about everything and simply don't click on, on links and emails particularly if you weren't expecting that communication. But even then, it's always best to go back to the source. Um, unsecured Wi-Fi hotspots, I understand people want to preserve their data. That can be extremely expensive. But if you're going to use uh, unsecured Wi-Fi at places like airports and hotels and coffee shops, always use a VPN. Make sure that you are protecting that information. It, 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 if you think of the, the packets of information going over the internet from your device um, to whatever website or, or server that you're retrieving that information from, without a VPN, it, it's in a see-through tube. And anybody that has the desire can uh, sniff around and watch every transaction. And that includes you typing in your, your passwords and, and your login information. A VPN basically puts a shield around that pipeline and makes it so that it's not visible to anyone that wants to snoop. Peer-to-peer -peer filing uh, file sharing is not as popular as it was, but it's still definitely something especially young people are doing. And a lot of times they think that, aside from the, the pirating issues and those types of activities, they feel like they are doing something that is relatively safe because they're simply picking and choosing what files they want to share, whether it's pictures or movies or books. Uh, oftentimes, especially the really shady peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing programs, they will have the auto settings on basically share everything. So if you have a family computer where you've been doing your taxes, but your child also has a lot of um, 
you know, entertainment and media on the computer, they could unknowingly share every single file that's on your hard drive and on your desktop within that uh, peer-to-peer filing file sharing network. And we've seen occurrences of that. So it's really something to pay attention to. And then the downloading of software or apps from unknown sources, that's a really tough one because we all love um, new apps. They can make life really handy, but we tend not to look at uh, the permissions and not look at how much we're sharing. So we've got sort of two layers here. You've got the downright Um, scammy, non-privacy centric apps that can really do a lot of damage. And then you've got legitimate organizations that are really just banking on the fact that your data is super valuable to them and you're going to be willing to trade that for this uh, free service. And the message that I want to get to people here is uh, the price, you may think it's free, but it's not, you're, you're paying for it with your data. And while it may not be an identity credential and it may not be sensitive, it still has a lot of value. So really consider what the actual price is that you're paying. Now we're, I'm gonna turn this over to Sina for the warning signs of tax identity theft and she'll get a little bit more granular in here so that hopefully you can spot those red flags. Thanks, Eva. Um... I, I love that image of unse- using unsecure Wi-Fi as like having your data in a see-through tube. Um, really, really important to, to remember. But let's turn now to the warning signs of tax ID theft. Uh, and those warning signs are usually pretty clear. Uh, having your social security number stolen or compromised, it's not necessarily a warning sign it's being misused, but it puts you at increased risk. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, A delay in getting your refund, that also can be a sign of fraud. However, by far the most common way that people are now discovering their victim is by getting a notice from the IRS. In the best case and in an increasingly common case, the IRS lets you know that a suspicious return has been filed in your name. And on a very positive note, the IRS has done a lot of work so that they can do a better job of detecting tax identity theft. And in more and more cases, contact the legitimate taxpayer when they receive a suspicious tax return so that they can verify that it's being filed by the real taxpayer. And if it's not, avoid issuing that taxpayer's refund uh, to the identity thief. But when a fraudulent tax return makes it through, you're also likely to hear about it from the IRS. Uh, For example, if you're trying to file electronically, the IRS may reject your return as a duplicate filing. That usually means that it's already received a tax return that used your social security number, and you may get a similar notice if you file by, by mail. Or you may get a notice from the IRS saying you didn't report all of your income. That could be a sign uh, of the employment-related identity theft that we discussed earlier. Or you may get a notice saying that the social security number you're using uh, for your dependent already has been used by somebody else. Or that there's been a separate tax filing, uh, tax return already filed for that dependent. Whatever the case, it's generally the IRS that's going to let you know that tax identity theft has has occurred. Uh, but there are steps uh, that you can take to lessen the chance that tax identity theft will happen to you. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Eva again. Thanks, Thanks Sina. And I, I want to mention, we're focused on IRS here, and that is by far um, the largest number of uh, fraudulent issues that we're seeing or that are available to us and we're aware of are coming through the IRS platform. But uh, we don't want to forget that state, uh, you know, boards of taxation, state revenue departments, they can also have fraud issues. And unlike the IRS, if a thief gets your so, uh, a hold of your social security number and decides to activate it and use it within the IRS platform, they can only do that one time. If they decide to use it within the state taxation um, 
ecosystem, they can potentially use it more than once because unfortunately not all of the states, and I, I believe it's 42 states, I think there are eight states that don't have uh, state taxes, but th these systems don't all interact with each other. They don't all speak to each other. And so there is the potential that you can have um, fraudulent taxes filed at a state other than your state of residence. And the only reason that I bring that up is I do want people to pay attention to those notifications. So, you, you know, you get some kind of notification from the IRS, you, you sit up, you take notice, you know, oh gosh, this is important, I need to pay attention to that. You know, but let's say that you live in um, California and you get a notice from the uh, Arizona Department of Taxation or Department of Revenue, you may not give that any weight. You may go, well, why are they getting in touch with me? I don't live in Arizona. I don't really need to pay attention to this. And I'm going to encourage people to please, if you get notifications like that from those entities and states other than where you work and live, please open them up and take a look at them. It could be them trying to warn you of a fraud issue in another state. And it is possible that a thief can accomplish that. So now let's talk about um, how can you reduce your risk? And, and it's true that there are things that are out of the, the taxpayer and the consumer's hands, but there are a lot of things that you can do yourself. I think from a big picture, what's really important is that folks need to realize that their identity and those identity credentials has extraordinary value to thieves, regardless of how much value they have to you or your perceived status. Um, I've talked to folks that, that say things like, well, my credit is terrible, um, so the thief can have it. You know, good luck doing anything meaningful with my terrible credit score. And the, the reality is that you can very likely still get payday loans, even if your credit score is poor. And you may look at that and go, well, that's not of any value to me because I'm not going to take out a payday loan. I don't want to pay 30% interest on something. A thief doesn't care. They're not paying that debt back. They don't care how high the interest rate is. So it still has incredible value to them. Um, and being a high wage or a high dollar earner, you know, people think, well, that's, those are really the people that are more susceptible. But the thieves know how to monetize all of these identity credentials. They know how to take over um, social security uh, accounts and those benefit accounts. That's, that's not a lot of money. It's not like we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we are talking about the money that someone is using to live on. And they don't, Again, they don't care. That is certainly valuable to them. I also want to focus on the fact that it's, it's really not um, just, just one big thing that you can do. Small actions will add up. I always call it practicing good identity hygiene. If you think of it in terms of your health, you don't go into your doctor's office and say, okay, doc, what's the, what's the one thing I can do to make sure that I'm living a healthy life? Uh, he's not going to give you one piece of advice and say, now you don't have to worry about anything else. On the contrary, it's little actions that you do. It's things like, you know, you, you brush your teeth every day and, you, and he's going to tell you to get enough rest and try to de-stress your life and practice good eating habits most of the time. And it, it's very similar to that. Um, be aware that every step that you take uh, actually will have an impact um, and, it, and it's all going to add up in the end. So all those little things you do, not clicking on that link, not um, answering that scam phone call and giving up your information, all of that is going to add up. But it's not just what you do, it's also what you don't do. Um, and, and this is my, probably my biggest tip here. And I touched on it before when I was talking about the, stat, the state tax entities and ignoring that information. Please don't ignore the information that's presented to you and just cast it aside. Even if you're looking at something that you think, uh, that's just a mistake. Um, they're not talking to me. Uh, my child, my eight-year-old child just got a jury summons. Uh, that's got to be a mistake. I'm not going to follow up on that. Um, I just got a notification from a bank, that a, a financial institution that I never have banked at saying my account's overdrawn. Well, they can't possibly be talking about me. These could be organizations that are trying to get in touch with you to alert you about fraud. 
everybody has a vested interest and a lot of these organizations are employing and deploying a myriad of fraud analytics, but that's all they can do uh, and, until they notify you and get word that, no, that wasn't me. I didn't actually do that. So that's one of the big pieces that you as a consumer can do, and that can be one of uh, your parts that you can do. So we have some real life examples of tax identity theft, and I, I don't think I'll share all of these because I know that we're um, coming up on, on time. So um, I think I'm just going to read one of these. I think I'll do Felicia's story, and that is that she started receiving notices from the IRS stating that the taxes she filed in 2013 had an outstanding balance of $331. Uh, however, in 2013, she was only 15 and she wasn't working. She said that she went to the IRS website, printed out a copy of her transcripts to see what had happened, and she saw that her mother somehow got her employer to issue two separate checks, one with her name on it so that she didn't have to pay for the extra taxes. Um, Felicia was able to uh, get her mother to admit to this and told her that she needed to uh, inform the IRS herself and plead guilty and let the IRS know that, that Felicia was not in, at fault. And if not, Felicia said she would be forced to file a police report. Talk about a really hard conundrum for a kid. And this happens more and more often than we would like to think as a, a crime of opportunity where parents and guardians and those in positions of authority over children have access to those identity credentials. Um, we are finding that they are misused, uh, not only in really shady ways where you want to waggle your finger at the parents and, and tell them shame on you for doing that to your child, but also in, in ways that are sort of a means to an end, where you can see that these guardians had good intentions, they needed to get the lights turned on, um, they had an outstanding balance that they couldn't pay, so they decided to use their, their child's identity credentials in order to meet that need. Both of those activities really set up these kids for some devastating consequences, and it, and it leaves them with a big mess uh, to clean up when they're trying to launch. And the, the reason we bring that up is because it's not just um, issues with financial identity theft, where those accounts are open. Tax identity theft, as in the case of Felicia, can have a lot of those same consequences for kids. So here's a few um, items on how you can minimize your risk of tax identity theft. Um, knowing your tax preparer, making sure that you've done your research to uh, make sure that they are licensed or registered, they say they're a CPA, double check on that licensure, and look at their process. Uh, make sure that they are using encrypted methods if they ask you to um, send them files, and, and if they're using a database, that it's a fully protected, password protected and encrypted database, and ask them how they're going to be good stewards of this very sensitive information. Um, file first, beat the crooks. Please file your returns as early in the tax season as possible. I talked to some folks who will tell us, um, you know, I have to wait for all of these documents and get them together and you're telling me to try to do this as quickly. And I understand everyone has a different life picture and I'm just saying do it as soon as is, is practically possible. And for those folks that do have to pay, uh, remember, I know that that's a painful situation to be in, but the thieves don't care. They will structure the return as if there's a refund, and so they will file early. So if you can, file early. Don't put it off just because it's either inconvenient or painful. Now, if you're, if you're mailing, don't just leave these in your outgoing mail on the street. There are always uh, rashes of mail theft when the um, documents are coming in in January and then when they're going out again in March and April. If you're filing electronically, use a secure network and please remember if you actually are filing um, in a cafe or in an airport on uh, public Wi-Fi, please, please, please use a VPN. Um, and your returns, you know, you don't need to store returns for 30 years. You only need to keep them for, you know, I think it's seven years, maybe keep them up to 10. And when you do store them, um, store them securely. Don't just leave them laying around. Hopefully you have a locking um, filing cabinet or a lockbox that you can store them in. 
I'll just go over these briefly because this will reduce your overall risk of different types of identity theft, just good principles to keep in mind. Um, remember, it's valuable, protect what you have. You, you don't need to carry everything in your wallet. You don't need to keep pictures of um, all of your cards or data in your um, camera roll on your smartphone. And the things, the items that you do have and that you do keep at home, keep them in a secure and locked location. Uh, when you think about oversharing, that's sort of the, the motto of our generation. So I always say, um, if you wouldn't put it out on a billboard in front of your house, you don't need to share it publicly, and that includes social media. When you're interacting with organizations, businesses, medical providers, um, you don't have to give them every piece of information that they're asking for. And again, I'm not talking about uh, medical histories and things like that. You do need to provide that to your doctor. But your identity credentials, they only need a limited number of those. So leave some of those boxes blank. And if they tell you that they have to have them, ask why. And if they can't tell you how they're going to protect that data, well, then perhaps you need to do an evaluation of whether or not you're going to do business or seek the services from that company. Um, again, I go back to monitor and review. Review the mail that's coming into you. See if somebody's trying to notify you about something untoward. Review your financial statements. Um, annualcreditreport.com will allow you to see one of your credit reports for free annually and you can go over that if you if you do one every four months from each of the bureaus then it can uh, something you can do for free and it can give you at least a good picture of um, at least the last four months you'll know that you're caught up and nothing has been happening and then of course when you do have to get rid of those documents that have your sensitive PII on it go ahead and shred those don't just throw them um, in the dumpster by far and away Freezing your credit is one of the most robust consumer protection steps that you can take. And very recently, due to legislation that was passed, um, somewhat uh, due, something we've been fighting for for a long time, but it's somewhat due to the Equifax breach, there was a real uh, grassroots movement there. It's now free in all 50 states. The minor, minor inconvenience of doing this really does not outweigh the benefits. So it, and if you're not familiar what a freeze is, I would encourage you to come to the Identity Theft Resource Center website and, and, and the Federal Trade Commission and get more granular information. But in a nutshell, it, it basically it will freeze your credit so that new creditors cannot uh, open new lines of credit. Anyone new who does not have an existing relationship with you cannot get access to that information. Um, but your existing relationships, the credit card companies, the loans that you already have out, they are not affected. So now I'm going to let Sina talk more about some of the resources, what you can do if tax identity theft happens to you, and some of the great stuff on identitytheft.gov. Great. Thank you, Eva. I appreciate it. Um, and, and that's such terrific information. I'm thinking about what you, what you mentioned about uh, oversharing and, and not just handing over information when, when you're asked for it, say, on a medical form. I found in my own life that, that in many doctor's offices, if you question why do they need your social security number, they'll say, oh, that's just the form. You don't need to fill that in. So it's good to remember you, you can push back a little bit. But what if identity theft does happen to you? Um, I'm going to talk here about identitytheft.gov, which is the federal government's one-stop resource for identity theft victims. Uh, but the IR, ITRC also has great resources, and the FTC partners with the ITRC to send some of our most complicated identity theft complaints to the ITRC for additional assistance. We're very grateful that the ITRC is there to assist people who need extra help. But we do encourage people as a first step to visit identitytheft.gov because many people can handle things on their own using the website. So here we see the, the opening page when you type in identitytheft.gov, this is what you'll see. And as you can see there, identitytheft.gov is going to allow you to report identity theft and get a personal recovery plan. You see in the upper right-hand corner that we have the entire website in Spanish too. 
And there's an innovation that we just introduced last year that lets you now report tax identity theft to the FTC and the IRS through identitytheft.gov. Let me walk you through how to do that. As I said, this is the screen that you'll see when you type in identitytheft.gov on your com computer. When you get uh, click Get Started, you would get to this next screen. And in the next slide, please. And here you'll see several different identity theft situations that you can pick from. You can simply report identity theft and the system will then ask you more questions to figure out what kind of identity theft has occurred. Or you can report that someone has filed a tax return using your information, that's, that's tax identity theft. There are also a couple other categories here. If you just want information about identity theft, because uh, you're worried about it or your information has been exposed in a data breach, you can click on that, that line and get more information about how you can protect your information that's been ex exposed at, but not yet misused. You can take certain steps that can help you protect it yourself against actual misuse. But here, let's say someone wants to report um, tax identity theft, and that's what we've clicked with that, that dark blue line. So next slide, please. The system's going to go through a few steps to, to get more information about what happened. And uh, you can see there at the top, uh, it's going to be going through steps to get the details of the identity theft, your information, information about the suspect, uh, a personal statement, and then it'll give you a chance to review your, your complaint. It's going to use that information uh, to create an FTC identity theft report, uh, plus an IRS identity theft affidavit or a form 14039, uh, and a personal recovery plan, and then walk you through each of the steps to take. So on the next screen here, Please, you'll see an example of an FTC identity theft report. This report can be used to exercise certain of your rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This is important because as we've mentioned, if your social security number is exposed, then you're at risk for new account identity theft. And if that happens, a, a lot of times, uh, you're going to be needing to contact credit reporting agencies and others um, to get those ancillary identity theft incidents resolved. So this is the identity theft report that you'd use for that. Uh, and in many cases, you're not going to even uh, need a police report anymore as a matter of course for tax identity theft uh, matters and, and many other identity theft matters. Uh, because this identity theft report from the FTC can help you clean up your credit. So let's go to the next slide. And this is an identity, a tax identity theft uh, affidavit that you file with the IRS. Identitytheft.gov is going to use the information you set in on those information collection screens, and it's going to pre-populate this form for you so that everything uh, is ready to go uh, once, once you've reached the screen. And identitytheft.gov is going to file this IRS affidavit directly to the IRS for you, making the process of reporting it to the IRS very easy for consumers. Uh, on this next screen, uh, you'll see an example of a recovery plan. Uh, at the top, you see uh, that this is for someone who's created an account for with identitytheft.gov, and I'll explain that in a minute. In a minute, but whether or not you create an account, the system's going to submit your IRS identity theft affidavit for you and tell you that it's been submitted. And you can see that on the right hand side. It'll give you the date the affidavit was submitted, and it lets you download a copy of the completed affidavit for your records. Submitting the affidavit starts the process with the IRS of, inve of investigating your tax ID theft and hopefully clearing things up so that you can get whatever refund is due to you. 
Now, if you look at the orange lines, you see the personalized recovery plan. This is the type of recovery plan you get if you report tax identity theft. It will tell you things like contact the IRS, place a fraud alert, review your credit reports, and consider placing an extended fraud alert, alert or credit freeze. And for each of those uh, orange lines, if you click on them, they'll give you more detailed information and links. For example, if you were to click on contact the IRS, it will tell you what to do if you get an IRS notice in the mail. It'll all show, show that you have actually completed your IRS affidavit and submitted it. And it will give you other advice about steps to take in a specialized phone number at the IRS for addition, you can call for additional assistance if these steps don't resolve your situation. Okay, on this next screen, um, as I mentioned, the system gives you an option of creating an account with identitytheft.gov. If you do that, you'll be able to come back into, into the website and update your recovery plan. Say if you discover new forms of identity theft that have occurred and you need additional re recovery steps to, uh, to deal with them. An account also lets you take advantage of several other features uh, of identitytheft.gov. In particular, if you need to send letters to businesses, debt collectors, or others to resolve new account fraud or other forms of identity theft, the system will create those letters for you using the information you provided. All you'll need to do is print out the letters, sign them, and mail them. That, that's just a great feature. And when you create an account, we protect that account by using two-factor authentication. Uh, that basically means that you'll create a password, and then you'll uh, use that password to enter the system, and you'll also get a call or a text with a PIN so that we can make sure that the person logging back into that account is really you. Okay, one of, on this next screen, I want to just call one other thing to your attention, and that's identitytheft.gov has a dedicated page with information for people whose information has been lost or exposed in a data breach. As you can see, it has information based on the type of, uh, type of personal data that has been compromised. As well as, as well as information for victims of specific types of data breaches. Importantly, for people concerned about tax identity theft, uh, there's information about what you can do if your social security number has been exposed, but you don't yet have any evidence that it's been misused. Again, all the information is available in both English and, and Spanish. Okay, and so on this next screen, um, we've mentioned IRS imposter scams a few times, and it's a problem that's related to tax identity theft. Eva, can you tell us a little bit more about IRS imposter scams, what they are, and the warning signs? Absolutely, Sina, and they are just what they sound like. It is an imposter pretending to be representing the IRS. They will generally call. Sometimes these come through email and texting, but there's a lot of scammy phone calls, and they will say that you owe back taxes. Oftentimes, people report that they are feeling very intimidated and threatened. They're being told that they will be arrested or deported or suffer some kind of other penalty or harm if they don't immediately, immediately pay these back taxes. Uh, sometimes these scammers will know all or part of your social security number, which gives them some credibility, but that is not a good litmus test. Just because they know have that data does not mean they're automatically you can trust they're from the IRS. Uh, sometimes they can, this happens so often now, they can rig your caller ID to make it look like it is um, from Washington, D.C., or that it, that it will even say IRS on your caller ID. I'm sorry to say that you simply can no longer trust your caller ID. Spoofing has just become too ubiquitous. One of the really key things to watch out for is that demand for immediate payment. Um, they will often ask by things like prepaid debit cards, wire transfer, or even gift cards. Um, but it's the demand for immediate payment and putting on that very high pressure that should just be an absolutely huge red flag. Um, the IRS will allow you, if you legitimately owe back taxes, they will allow you 
um, to set up a payment plan. We do not have debtor's prisons. If you have a legitimate debt with the IRS, um, you will not just be thrown in jail. Um, they will also, a lot of times these scammers will send um, bogus emails to further their scheme so that the, so that if they get your con additional contact information, they may send these very uh, slick looking emails to make you believe that you really are interacting with the IRS. And um, before I get, let Sina talk about the um, reports about the imposter scams and how prevalent it is, I, I just want people to realize that um, going back to the source and confirming that you're actually talking to the IRS, and this applies for any type of scam call, no legitimate entity is going to um, try to stop you or tell you, no, no, you can't verify that I'm really calling from, you know, a bank or from your healthcare provider or from the IRS. You always have the option of saying, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to give you any other, other information. I'm going to verify that I'm actually talking to who you say you are, and that, that's what we encourage everyone to do. And now, Sina will talk more about um, the stats behind how prevalent this scam is. Thanks, Deepa. And uh, as I said, we, we get complaints about IRS imposter scams um, regularly. And looking back over the past six years, we saw complaints surged from just about 2,200 in 2013 to nearly 123,000 in 2016. Uh, there was good news between 2016 and 2017. We saw an, an enormous drop. And what we know happened was that in October 2016, the Department of Justice, the Treasury Inspector General, and the FTC, and some other agencies, together we did a massive raid on call centers in India. And those raids shut down a number of call centers that were doing these IRS imposter scams. After those raids, there was that dramatic decline that you see in the number of IRS imposter scams reported. Now, since 2017, we're seeing the, the complaint numbers creeping up. And that's why it's important to know that IRS imposter, uh, about IRS imposter scams and how to reduce the chances of it becoming a problem for you. So on this next slide, uh, these are the points that, that Eva has really just gone over, uh, just, just to they bear repeating because they're so important. The IRS, just know the IRS is not going to ask you to pay with prepaid debit cards or wire transfers. They're not going to ask for a credit card number over the phone. They're not going to threaten you with arrest or deportation or loss of your, your driver's license. That's not how the IRS uh, operates. And next slide. There's some other things to know. If the IRS needs to contact you, it's going to generally first be by mail. Uh, I, I will note, uh, again, as, as Eva mentioned, you know, there, there are, are some instances where, where third-party debt collectors are now collecting uh, debt for the IRS. But if this is you, if you're in that situation, hearing from the IRS debt collector is not going to come as a shock. You'll have had a lot of communication from the IRS first. And the IRS will also notify you when it's transferring, transferring your debt. As Eva said, you have the absolute right to verify who's, uh, who's calling you. And if the uh, person who's calling you is a legitimate debt collector for the IRS, they're going to recognize that. You can contact the IRS directly. Uh, that's the number 800-829-1040. You can call the IRS uh, and, and confirm that the debt collector um, that, that's contacting you is, in, in fact, legitimately collecting debt for the IRS. Again, it should not come to you a shock, as you, a shock to you if you're hearing from the debt collector. You can also check to see if you owe back taxes, and I'm sorry, I don't have this on the slide, but if you type into, if you go to the IRS website and type in irs.gov slash balance do one, one word, you can see if in fact you, you owe back taxes. Okay, on the next slide. No, there you are, thank you. Um, I also want to remind people to report IRS 
uh, imposter scams, please report them. That's how the that raid in India occurred and, and made such a terrific dent in, in, in calls from IRS uh, imposter scammers. File your report. You can file with the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, and there's the information there, uh, tigta.gov or 800-366-4484. You can also report at the FTC, and that would be ftc.gov slash complaint, or you can call us at 877-FTC-HELP. Okay, that's a great. That's a great way to, to close out um, this extremely informative webinar, Sina. Reporting is paramount. It's key. That's how uh, investigative and law enforcement entities are able to identify patterns and then eventually shut down these bad actors and, and try to limit the damage that they do and, and stop some of these events from happening. Um, now, the Identity Theft Resource Center is not a reporting agency, so we cannot take those reports, which is why we encourage people to go um, get that FTC affidavit so that they can track that information. But we are a victim services organization, and all of our information is free. We have our toll-free call center number at 888 400 5530. There's a live chat feature on our website, which is ID Theft center.org and you can even download the free ID theft help app that was funded uh, through uh, the Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime Vision 21 funding and it's a great way to have a lifeline to us we have a privacy quiz we have uh, we'll be sending push notifications about scams and fraud and and other identity centric issues that could be in your region so it's just a great way to get in touch with us and and again, all of our services are free. Great. Thanks, Eva. And I, I do want to thank you and the whole team at ITRC. It's always a pleasure working with you, and we really appreciate you hosting this webinar with us. As Eva mentioned, uh, the FTC, the ITRC has great resources. You can also visit the FTC for for additional information, uh, and we have information, you would visit the FTC at consumer.ftc.gov, and you can find out lots of information there about identity theft and tax-related identity theft. We also have a website, ftc.gov slash bulk order, where you can find all of our print materials on this, and you can order those materials for free in bulk and, and share them uh, with with your community, if you're if you're giving a presentation on on this information, it's it's great to uh, share that information and distribute uh, these materials. So please do visit that website. That's ftc.gov slash bulk order one word. And well, I think that wraps up. Thank you. It for does. Thank you, Sina. And thank you, everyone who is listening, for taking the time to get this important information.